I remember in 1990s, I was a college intern at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, United States. And I was there for an eat prayer and a well-meaning staff at the consulate actually came to me and asked me a question. Young man, what are you studying? I said, I studied gin. What do you mean? Gin like in genie? No, 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 no. I meant gene like in genome. Oh, okay. So he got a bit confused. And he said, what are you going to do in Indonesia studying all those unseen things? Well, that's actually a good question. So here I am standing before you. It's going to talk about gene editing, or I would say gene tinkering, because now humanity can do something to their own genome. They can edit something, they don't remove something they don't like. But is it a yay or nay? So that's actually an interesting thing to think about. Imagine a brave new world where humanity should not worry anymore about a viral infection. You have to worry about HIV infection anymore because they are immune to it. And also another scenario that they don't have to worry about where they can get their next heart. Because sometimes when you get ailing heart, you need a heart transplant, you very difficult to find donor. So how about if you can order online a pig heart, a pig, yeah, a pig, an animal heart, you can order online to replace your own broken heart. Well, not literally broken heart, but to replace your not really functioning heart anymore. So I'm going to tell you a story about two scientists that is trying to make this thing happen, to solve this health problem. So on your left, you see it's uh, Hei Jian Kui, and on your right is Dr. Mohi Udin. So Hei Jian Kui has created massive backlash and fury from international community of scientists themselves. On the other hand, Dr. Mohi Udin was pra wins praise in spite of his Islamic background a religion which has clearly prohibited the use and consumption of pigs. So why do these two scientists receive widely different responses in spite of their well-intentioned effort to improve health? So let me outline the agenda of my talk today. There are about four of them. So one, I'm going to talk to you how the technology itself works, this so-called gene editing. And then second, I'm going to elaborate why and how this Hei and Kui got into trouble, and why Dr. Mohidin gets the praise. And the third one is a difficult one. The third one, we're going to explore the current thinking, whether gene editing as a technology is a go or a no-go. And lastly, we all want to find out what happened with the babies that are genetically edited, and also to the patients who receive a pig heart that has been edited. So what is gene editing? Gene editing itself is a technology, is an accumulation of many, many different technology before and involves many different scientists. Many of them are very talented ones. But these two women are especially uh, important. They are Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna because they make gene editing a cheaper, easier, and more practical approach. So the gene editing technology that won the Nobel Prize was based on a very interesting observation. It was based on a study of how bacteria fight their arch enemies. Who are they? The virus that are infecting the bacteria. If the bacteria is not responding well, the virus is going to inject the DNA and essentially blow up the bacteria. Of course, the bacteria don't want to do that, so they have to have some sort of machinery to fend this infection off and this machinery is called CRISPR-Cas9 system. So let's take a look how it works. So here is the bacterial genome. Right before you, you see the picture of bacteria, and I want, to, want you to pay attention to this blue convoluted structure. It's called the bacterial genome. So within the bacterial genome, there is a set of clusters of regularly in the space short palindromic repeats. A mouthful, I know and you don't have to memorize all that. Basically, scientists call it CRISPR. And next to CRISPR, there is a gene called Cas9. So let's imagine there's an incoming virus. The virus will intact its genome into the bacteria, and the bacteria will fight back by chopping up the viral genome. You see? It will chop up the viral genome. So 
after chopping up the DNA of the invading virus, the bacteria is actually collecting piece and bits of the viral DNA as trophies. So as you see here in CRISPR, CRISPR itself is basically a collection of trophies of dead viruses that bacteria has been collecting as it fights off the viruses. These trophies, or CRISPR, are a way to help bacteria to remember the identities of their past enemies. So our Nobel Prize winners got an idea. So they ask, what if we can take advantage of this CRISPR-Cas9 into our own system and ask, can we actually remove part of our own genome to our advantage? So basically, instead of a viral DNA, they're going to use and find and match part of human genome. And you may want to ask, why would we want to remove part of our own genome? Isn't our genome natural? Isn't it natural is good? Well, nature sometimes can be unkind. Why I would say that? Because sometimes during the natural processes, some of our genes got mutated. And we know when they got mutated, some of us will get cancer. And some of us having certain variation of these natural genes, they get more susceptible to viral infection. So this is the idea that eventually got He Jian Gui into a deep trouble. What he did, he wanted to delete CCR5 gene and the gene that's actually required for HIV infection. So why he was in the trouble? So let's find out what's going on. So a few years earlier, a couple went to He Jian Gui. So this couple, the father has actually HIV infection. He is HIV positive person, and he wanted to conceive a child. But then he worried that the baby may get HIV just like himself. So is there a way to avoid this kind of infection? So in order for the HIV virus to enter the cells, it requires interaction with a human protein called CCR5. And in nature, 10% of human has this very interesting variance of the CCR5. They are missing 32 amino acids from the CCR5. So he proposed to the parent, look, would you allow me to edit your embryo of your future baby and remove these 32 amino acids from CCR5 gene so then the baby will be immune from HIV infection? The idea seems to be straightforward, and the parents agreed for the, during the procedure. So how did they do it? In order to explain this the entire process, I'm going to remind you about what is called this in vitro fertilization process. So many couples want to get babies, but things happen, so they cannot get the babies in a natural ways. So the way in vitro fertilization works is something like this. The mother will have the uh, the uh, eggs coming out, and also the father will get the sperm coming out. So in a laboratory, in the dish, they're going to mix the eggs and the sperm together and let the fertilization happening. So in this entire scheme of the process, when you want to do gene editing, there's an additional step. After you're mixing the, the eggs and the sperm in a in tube, in a, in a dish, the process of editing begins. But then there was a big mistake. Before the embryo being transplanted back to the mother's womb, the team, they make assessment. And they realize that apparently the target was not right. So remember the original idea to remove the 32 amino acids? This is actually the original idea. So they want to remove the 32 amino acids in order for the babies to get resistant to HIV infection. In fact, they get less amino acids being deleted. And even worse, many cells in the embryo did not get the gene deleted at all. What does it mean? So it means the embryos still are in susceptible to HIV infection. At this point, He Jian Kui and his team should not proceed with transplanting the embryo into the wombs of the mother. This actually caused his job. A lapse in his decision to go ahead to, and went ahead and transplant the embryos actually created an uproar to the, to the scientific community. 
and he now paid uh, his mistake by going to jail for three years. And he's just being released earlier this year. So that was uh, the story of uh, Dr. Hay, and which is very different with Dr. Mahiuddin. Dr. Mahiuddin gets lots of praise. The procedure of heart transplant in human itself is not very difficult. It's very really straightforward. You find the donor, you get the heart out of the donor, and then the heart will be transplanted back in to the recipient. Simple as that. The problem is finding the donors. There are 4,000 adults and children in the United States every year waiting for the right donor. And many of them, they died before finding the right donor. So we have a problem with scarcity. So in 1960s, Dr. Har Dr. Hardy, he had this thinking, what can we use as alternative? Can we use CHIMP? After all, chimp genome is about 99.9% identical to human beings, right? So is it possible to use heart of a chimpanzee transplanted to human? So he did try that, and after about an hour of the procedure, the patients died. Apparently, it's not as easy. So what could be an alternative to chimpanzee? In the 1950s and 60s, people actually trying to isolate tons of pancreatic from pigs and to get few milligrams of insulin. But the, my point is, apparently, pigs are compatible to human being. What about its heart? Now, in order to do this kind of transplantation, you need to overcome a couple of hurdles. One, you have to make sure that the pig's heart are immunocompatible to human immune system. And second, you have to make sure you're able to remove all the pig viruses that are embedded in the pig genome. So before the advent of gene editing, it is very difficult to edit this kind of genome of the pigs. But CRISPR-Cas9 system makes them all possible. So what Dr. Mohiuddin and his team did was to remove all the antigen, all the protein in the pigs that will elicit a very strong immune reaction. He did that, and he also removed many pigs' virus genome and to make sure that there are no viral gene in the heart, of the gene-edited heart. So obviously now we want to know what's happening. What's happened to the babies? Because they apparently um, they have this uh, artificial gene in their genome now, what happened to the patients? Uh, was the, was, did the patient survive or not? So before we find out what happened to the gene-edited babies and what happened to the patient who got this uh, pig heart, let's first uh, think about uh, three tests or uh, three criteria, at least according to current thinking, whether we should go or no-go with this gene-editing process. The first one, we have to ask, whether the gene editing is medically justifiable and religiously sanctioned. What do I mean by that? Because when it comes to Heijian uh, Kui's problem, apparently he did not need to do this gene editing. He could simply just wash the sperm of the father and do a regular in vitro fertilization procedure. However, he did not do that. So, when it comes to medical justification, you have to make sure to make the case that there is no other alternative except for gene editing. Many religious leaders think if there is no other alternative, usually they have no problem with this new technology. But then you have to pass the second test. What is the second test? The second test you have to ask whether the gene editing itself is precise enough to do it in human. What Hei Kui did show us apparently our technology is not that precise. Instead of getting 32 amino acids deleted, he got less uh, deletion of the genome. So that's actually one of the problems. The other problem, our genome is a huge collection of genetic information. So what happens is if you delete one gene, it may affect the function of other genes. And we don't know the consequences of that. And the third one, we need to be very careful because when we start editing our genes and our genomes, what if these variants move into the society gene pool? 
So when it comes to Hei Jian Kui, it's going to be a really problematic because when somebody has this unnatural variance, we don't know the consequences society will have on this variant. But when it comes to the heart transplant, as long as it's done on adult, that will not be passed down to the, to the next generation, they may not be a problem. So we have to be careful when we're going to decide a go or a no-go, a yay or a nay. So here comes the result. What happens to the genetic edited babies and what happened with our patients who got this big heart? So the babies are three years old now. They are toddlers. And many scientists around the world has been proposing, let's have this consortium to make sure we can monitor the well-being of these two individuals. After all, they are carrying unnatural variants of the genome. So we need to find out what happened. And what happened with our patient? Unfortunately, our patient with his pig edited heart, he died a couple months of the procedures. Why? The heart was swollen, so it's an indicative of apparently the gene editing missed. They missed some of the viral genome of the pig, and this viral genome apparently still can cause problem, causing this inflammation. So, with this results in hand, apparently many, many research still need to be done before we can make this process um, a practical one. So, in spite of all the results that we have, we still have some problems, we have some uh, obstacles with the gene-edited babies, with the heart transplant, but at the end of the day, we all know human is a thinking deliberating creature. Human loves to meet challenges and just simply do not want to give up. Certainly, the procedure of gene editing promises many good things to solve our health problems. However, we must be very, very careful. We shall be mindful when we do science. And although there are certain progresses, we should be very careful with the result that we get. In spite of all the best effort to predict what we want, sometimes, and we have to realize, they are unpredictable. And this unpredictability makes our life like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're going to get. Thank you.